It's hard to forget the way we felt when planes flew into the World Trade Center. A second airplane, a 727 just ran into the building. When the United States was attacked, when we mourned our loss, questioned our security, when so many people died at the hands of a distant enemy. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! The pain, the confusion, and the anger is still fresh. Our sovereignty was violated, our ego was bruised. But long before the 9-11 terrorist attack, there was another attack, another assault on our nation. One that's now tucked away in history books or stuck in the corner of our national conscience. It happened at 7.48 in the morning, long ago, far away. Surprise attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The, Japanese have the sky was filled with Japanese fighter planes and bombers. They blew up our ships, destroyed our planes, killed our sailors, soldiers, pilots, civilians. What happened that day shocked the nation and changed history. Drew us into a world war a long and torturous fight against the forces of evil, hatred, and persecution. We'll win through to absolute victory. It has been 75 years since Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and to mark the milestone, some of the men and women who survived returned to honor those who didn't. Many are now in their 90s, some over 100. They came to this island paradise with their wheelchairs, walkers, and memories. They shared their stories and their loss. Stories about men like Donald Stratton of Colorado Springs. We lost so many men. You can't even imagine what it was like. But I, I think about it every day. But why the good Lord spared me, I don't know, but uh, I'm here. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, these men were just boys who grew up fast. George Blake of Salida was one of them. I think of the age of the people. And I was 19 or 20 at the time, so we were all in that boat, but it, it bothers me. Remember those who died and those who did everything they could to save them. Men like Lieutenant Jim Downing of Colorado Springs. A few have been singled out as heroes, but in my estimation, everybody was a hero. Pearl Harbor, 75 years ago, a day when everybody was a hero. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Shapiro. I'm at the Visitor's Center in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This is where more than a million and a half people come every year to learn about what happened 75 years ago. For the next hour, photographer Manny Sotelo and I will take you to some of the events marking that historic anniversary. We'll look back at the attack through the eyes of the people that were here who experienced the horror and heroism that day. And we'll remember and honor those who were lost in the surprise attack. But we start with what it was like right here, December 7th, 1941. It started out as a sleepy Sunday morning in Hawaii. Everything seemed normal. This building, the Leolani Hale, was the seat of government for the Hawaiian Territory back in 1941. Looks kind of like it did back then, except the palm trees are bigger. But here and elsewhere across Hawaii, nobody was thinking about souring relations with Japan. On that Sunday morning, December 7th, people were thinking about a weekend in paradise. That all changed at 7.48 in the morning. 
We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. The base was attacked by fighter planes, bombers, and torpedo planes in two waves from six aircraft carriers. Here's how they snuck up on the island of Oahu. The first wave of 353 attack planes came from the north. It was actually detected by a new radar system that had been installed, but the lieutenant in charge thought it was U.S. bomber planes that were scheduled in from California that day. The fighters flew in over the mountains. They kind of appeared out of nowhere. They flew low and they strafed Kenahohe, shattering the peaceful morning in that tiny village. Other bombers attacked the air bases. They hit Hickam Field, which was the largest air base, and they hit Wheeler Field, the main U.S. Army fighter base. Some of the bombers flew in from the south up into Pearl Harbor. They hit the warships and the Navy fleet. A second wave of 171 planes came from the east. They also headed down to Pearl Harbor and hit the fleet there. 90 minutes after the battle began, it was over, but the war had just begun. The newspapers from back then screamed the headlines and told the stories of shock and pain. More than 2,400 Americans killed, more than 1,100 wounded. 18 ships were sunk or run aground, including five battleships, 188 aircraft destroyed. President Franklin Roosevelt addressed the nation the next day. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The damage was done. The smoldering debris could be seen for weeks. The deep wounds felt for 75 years. This was Denver in 1941. It looked a lot different, except for some places like the city county building. The city was really growing at the time with about 320,000 residents. And when the old Rocky Mountain News announced the country's entrance into the Second World War, volunteers flocked to the military recruitment centers. And it wasn't just young people. There are stories of people who had fought in the First World War showing up to re-enlist. There are stories of a 60-year-old man who uh, just broke down weeping when he was told he was too old to fight. A radio interview in Denver the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor expressed the mood. What is your name? Bob Seeker. Bob Seeker. And where do you work? The Cosmopolitan Hotel, Bellboy. And your age? 20. 20. Yes, and sir. you're in line for the draft too, I take it? Yes, in? sir. Were you expecting this? Well, not exactly. It seemed like they'd been trying to compromise some sort, and then when this all happened, it seemed kind of sudden. A lot more sudden than you figured it would be. Do you think uh, the United States is going to win? Yes, but it won't be right away. It'll take more, than, more time than people believe. It was a, a time when people just really were uncertain of what was happening around them and, and what the next day or the next night was going to bring. That uncertainty, and in some cases fear, led the president to sign an executive order that still echoes across the country to this day. It forced people of Japanese descent into one of 10 internment camps around the country. The camp called Amachi was tucked away in southeastern Colorado near Granada. Today, remnants still stand as a reminder of that dark time in our history. You can imagine the isolation that the people felt. People like Marion Takahara, as a 16, 17-year-old, you begin to wonder, why? You know, why am I here? I didn't know whether I was sad, because that's where I lived, and that was my home, and it was awful. It uh, was cramped, it was barren, it was a long way from the types of uh, environments that most people who were sent there were used to. Um, and it was confined. There were guard towers with guns. It was difficult, and it was uh, meant to be that way. Hello. Welcome back. Marion was one of 7,000 people who spent time at Amachi. 
Recently, she and other survivors returned there to celebrate those who made it out and to honor those who didn't. They remembered what it was like, how they lived in the barracks, formed schools, planted gardens, had beauty parlors and Boy Scout troops, remembered how they made the best of a bad situation, especially the children. The kids in Amache struggling to make sense of what was happening to them, but, but moving on and trying to live lives that had meaning and, and that were rich. You, you see this real spirit shine through. And when they were old enough, some of the kids volunteered, fought, and even died for the country that imprisoned their parents. What happened so far away at Pearl Harbor touched Colorado in other ways, personal ways. Pictures and letters that belong to Clara Mae Morse of Lamar, Colorado tell one sad story. Her two young sons, Norman and Francis, were on the USS Arizona. History Colorado historian Keith Shrum showed us two separate letters that she sent to them when she heard the news. She addressed them, my own dear son. God bless you and the whole U.S. fleet, she wrote. She asked Francis if he'd seen his brother Norman. The letters were no doubt written while in pain, probably stained by tears. Both letters came back, stamped unclaimed, returned to writer. Eventually, she received a letter from an Air Force commander. He is writing to Clara Mae Morris and telling her, I'm sorry to tell you, but your sons are missing. We are continuing our search. Well, she never really fully recovered after that, but she dedicated time and energy to helping others in the military. She became a nurse's aide and worked with veterans and veterans' families. What happened to Clara Mae Morris of Lamar, Colorado, sadly happened to mothers all over the country. Francis and Norman were one of 35 pairs of brothers on the USS Arizona when it was bombed. One pair survived. Coming up, we'll meet survivors of Pearl Harbor from Colorado, who returned 75 years after the attack. Their stories are vastly different, yet very similar, because of the shock, horror, and courage on display that day. It was just a ball of fire. We were inside, we just no way escaped from it. A bell sits in a clock tower at the University of Arizona in Tucson. It was salvaged from the USS Arizona, which was hit by a bomb and sank when Pearl Harbor was attacked. It almost didn't make it here. In 1944, an alum discovered by accident the bell was about to be melted down at a naval shipyard in Washington State. He saved it. It arrived on campus in 1946. The school dedicated the bell to the memory of the men who lost their lives on the Arizona. Welcome back as we take you back 75 years to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Out here on Battleship Row and the bases around it, three young men from Colorado went through something we can't even imagine. Seems like ancient history now, but they wanted to tell us their story so that this country never forgets. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. Of all the damage done at Pearl Harbor, probably the image that sticks with us the most is this one. Smoke and flames pouring from the sinking battleship USS Arizona. It's hard to imagine anyone in the middle of that could survive, but Donald Stratton of Colorado Springs was and did. It blew up, blew 110 foot of the ship clear off. Fireball went up in the air about five or 800 feet in the air and just engulfed us. At his home, he has pictures of the attack. It's stuck in his head, the explosions, the heat, the screams. On a model of the ship, he showed us where he was. Right about in here somewhere is where I was at. 60 feet up on the deck above the bridge at his battle station, an anti-aircraft gun. 
There were 20 men up there. It just engulfed us and a couple of them jumped out and where they went, we don't know to this day, but. Another ship, the USS Vestal, was tied up alongside the Arizona. As the men tried to escape the flames, a sailor on the Vestal threw them a line. A weight attached to it to carry it and he threw it across and tied a heavier line on it and we pulled it across to the Arizona, tied it off at the handrail and proceeded to cross the line to the vessel. They pulled themselves along that line, hand over hand, over the burning water. We started out about 65, 60 feet in the air and come down toward the water and the vessel was a smaller ship tied up alongside and of course we got it at the, at the bottom of the line. Then you had to go back up again because your weight was pulling the line down. And that was the hard part, but we made it. The sailor who threw the line saved six men that day. Didn't save the line. Donald Stratton's yeah. son says his name was Joe George. He was never honored for his heroism because he defied an order. An officer told him to cut the line. It was too dangerous. He didn't. This guy, he, he put his life on the line. They were shooting at, at the guys. If they would have cut the lines, they would have perished. I mean, he didn't have to do that, but he did. And that's what we want him to be recognized for. Joe George saved six lives and he didn't get nothing. I don't understand that. Don Stratton still carries the scars from that day 75 years ago. He had second and third degree burns over 70% of his body and spent 10 months in a hospital in San Francisco. But he was alive. 1,177 others weren't so lucky. Don actually re-upped in the Navy when he recovered and went back on to fight the war in the Pacific on another ship. But it's that dark day on the Arizona that he will never forget. We lost so many men. You can't even imagine what it was like. But I, I think about it every day. But why the good Lord spared me, I don't know, but uh, I'm here. At his home in Colorado Springs, he has knickknacks and a sign on his refrigerator that tell his story. Lieutenant Jim Downing is 103 years old now. He wears headphones to help him hear, but he's still as sharp as can be. 75 years doesn't seem that long ago. He was a Navy sailor on the USS West Virginia back then, stationed at Pearl Harbor, recently married, living in base housing. When the Japanese attacked, he left his home and his young bride and ran toward his ship. He remembers exactly how he felt. The first thing was surprise, and the next thing was fear. The first Japanese plane I saw come flying low and slow, banked over, cut loose the machine guns, went right over my head and dug a trench behind. And the war became pretty personal at that point. The ship was hit and started sinking. Lieutenant Downing did what he was trained to do, try to put out the fire but he also did a lot more. So I saw several of my shipmates lying there, didn't know whether they were dead or just wounded. And as I saw them there, I thought, now their parents will never know exactly what happened. So we wore name tags and fireproof lanterns. So with a fire hose in one hand, and uh, uh, I went around, looked at these name tags, tried to memorize who they were, with the plan to write the parents and tell them exactly what happened to their son the last few minutes. And that's what he did. He also sent notes like this one to the parents of men in the hospital after the attack. Some made it, others didn't. But their parents got to hear from them thanks to Lieutenant Jim Downing. He will never forget them. A few have been singled out as heroes, but in my estimation, everybody was a hero. He's kept many newspapers from back then. Lieutenant Downing wants that story, the one told in the newspapers back then, to be kept alive. 
And that's what happened at a recent book signing in Denver. Just a signature on yes, this Yes, just a signature, please. Thank you. Yes, Lieutenant Downing wrote a book called The Other Side of Infamy, My Journey Through Pearl Harbor and the World of War. Many of the people in the room were just interested in history. Others had stories of their own. Harold Kuwazaki's dad was there as a Japanese American living in Hawaii. The backlash from the bombings caused a lot of problems for him. Um, sorry, it makes me emotional. Pearl Harbor brings back many emotions to many people. For Lieutenant Jim Downing, there is one emotion that he feels strongly about. The strongest emotion was pride. Here we had uh, uh, sailors that uh, were untrained for what they needed to do. They didn't have leadership, but just instinctively, everybody did the right thing. No thought about the risk of their own lives. If this needed to be done, they did it. In the small Colorado community of Salida, on a wall in the heart of downtown, are the name of veterans who served in World War II. The names were actually put there starting in 1942, and the wall was only recently restored. Salida is that kind of town, proud, patriotic, grateful to those who served, like one of its residents, 94-year-old Pearl Harbor survivor, George Blake. See, most people, when they talk to a Pearl Harbor survivor, they, the first question they ask is, what ship were you on? And what they don't realize is there was a lot of Army. There was over 44,000 Army troops there, and their whole mission was to defend the harbor. Yes, George was Army, a 20-year-old staff sergeant from Brooklyn who, as he says, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. As his scrapbook shows, he signed up in peacetime, was sent to Pearl Harbor, and learn how to fire the big guns. And on that day when the bombs started falling, he did what he was trained to do. The first sergeant was there and said to me, you work your way down to the gun park, but stay under cover. And I remember thinking, there isn't much cover with a palm tree. <laughs> I can remember that. George's view of the attack was much different than many of the sailors. He saw the smoke coming from Battleship Row, but he didn't know what was happening there. Then I was given a 30 caliber and told to dig in along the edge of the harbor right by the water's edge, uh, really to prepare for an invasion. So I spent the next three months in a sand cave on a beach with a machine gun waiting for an invasion, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We couldn't send any mail out for a while. When we did, it was all censored. We had no mail coming in for quite a while. So my folks didn't know what, whether anything had happened to me or not for quite a while. George says he was one of the lucky ones. It just wasn't his time. But he thinks about the others often, and he wrote a poem to express his feelings. He titled it, Why You, Not Me. Out of the western sky they came, engines roaring, exhausts aflame. The sky was filled with attacking flights, strafing and bombing with all their might. It was Sunday morning and we were at rest, but when alerted, we did our best. And when the attackers did retreat, 3,500 casualties lay at our feet. It's okay. The poem goes on, I gaze at the list of young men who died. With pent emotions, I have cried. The tears I shed upon my cheek pose the question whose answer I seek. Why you and not me? Still ahead, smiles and tears mark the Pearl Harbor 75th anniversary events. For many of these survivors, this will be the last time they will get together to remember. We will never forget your courage under considerable fire and seemingly insurmountable odds. It was a day full of emotion, marking another day full of evil a long time ago.
an unlikely source helped raise money to build the USS Arizona Memorial, the king himself, Elvis Presley. In March of 1961, Elvis, who had gotten out of the army, performed a sold out benefit concert at Pearl Harbor. It raised $50,000, more than 10% of the final cost. The memorial was dedicated in 1962. December 7th, 2016. It's very early in the morning on a pier at Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickam. People are here to remember what happened 75 years ago. It's the National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day commemoration ceremony. Among those in the crowd, many survivors of the attack and veterans from World War II. It's a day to honor them. It's a day full of pomp and circumstance. It's a day full of tradition. And it's a day to show our gratitude. That includes the gratitude of Navy Listen Undersecretary Janine Davidson, Coloradan, and CU alum. I mean, with all the stuff going on in the world today, and you hear these heroic stories, and it reminds you of, you know, what America can do, it's, it's pretty moving. The ceremony starts with the presentation of the colors from the destroyer USS Halsey as it passes by the Navy Pier. Battleship Arizona survivor Donald Stratton of Colorado Springs has the honor of representing the entire U.S. military. Mr. Stratton will now return the salute to USS Halsey. Don Stratton, like the other survivors here, seems moved by the moment. Yeah. The thing that's uh, perhaps most moving about them is how humble they are. You know, they're not looking for any kind of recognition. Uh, they just, you know, they, they will always tell you, hey, we just did our job, did what the nation asked for us, did what the times required of us. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, we owe our way of life to them. The setting across from the Arizona Memorial could not be more perfect. It's a day to recognize those still with us, many in this crowd on the pier. It's a day to remember those who aren't, many in that ship across the water under the memorial. Take comfort in knowing that our departed World War II veterans continue to stand vigilant watch as guardian angels of our nation. Slowly, the survivors and veterans and their spouses make their way through a line of current sailors, saluting them and appreciating them. For many, this will be the last Remembrance Day ceremony they will attend. Their spirit will endure, as will their stories. But when they're gone, the stories will be more difficult to tell. Uh, the more you study Pearl Harbor, the more unanswered questions you find, and there will be no way to answer those because the witnesses are, are gone. Mid-morning on a pier at Pearl Harbor, the end of a solemn ceremony just a few hours away from a happier one. It's early afternoon at a park in downtown Honolulu. There is another ceremony to honor the survivors and veterans. This one has a little different feel. It features bagpipes, a drill team with very sharp bayonets, and a speech by actor Gary Sinise. Lieutenant Dan himself paying tribute to the Pearl Harbor survivors. Another one of the featured speakers is a survivor who we know very well. 103-year-old Lieutenant Jim Downing of Colorado Springs uses a familiar theme when he addresses the crowd. I think if the Defense Department ever decides to honor all of our heroes, they'll have to buy a copper mine in Utah and a cotton field in Texas to mold the metals and to weave the ribbons deserved. In my mind, everybody was a hero that morning. It's a day full of tributes to those heroes, a day full of emotion. It's December 7th, 2016. This marching band from Colorado is very special. They are in Hawaii to perform for the veterans. Coming up after the break, we'll talk about how this trip has affected them. We more of an appreciation for how much um, people give up for our country.
It is well known that more than 1,100 sailors perished when the USS Arizona was attacked. It's not as well known that 21 of them were members of Navy Band 22, which represented the Arizona. Navy Band 22 was supposed to compete in a best band competition later that month. That competition never happened, but the Arizona band was awarded the trophy anyway to honor the brave men who lost their lives. Welcome back to Everybody Was a Hero, 75 years after Pearl Harbor. The Pearl Harbor Parade is always a great event, and this year a band from Colorado is honored to be part of it. The Windsor High School Marching Band is in Honolulu to perform, but what do a bunch of 17 and 18 year old high school kids know about Pearl Harbor anyway? You'd be surprised. At Windsor High School in Northern Colorado, the band has been practicing a lot lately. It's a pretty special band. The room is surrounded by honors, trophies, and banners that are a testament to just how special. And there's something else in the room that is special, the American flag. That patriotic attitude comes mostly from the band's director, Rob Darrow. And I've been in the military for probably getting close to 20 years now. I uh, started in the Marines and the Air Force, and now I'm in the Army National Guard. Yes, he's a military guy that can easily be seen at marching band practice. Often the drill instructor in him comes out. Sometimes I have to make sure I don't do all drill instructor. <laughs> There are moments of, do this, and ah, I'm going to, you know, come do push-ups, ah, and do this and that. And then there's other moments of, oh, you sound so, so great, it's pleasant, yay. And so it's just a balance of the two. So sometimes he makes the band run laps. It's a military thing. But that military thing is also why Rob Dara is so excited about the band's latest honor, an invitation to play in the Pearl Harbor 75th anniversary parade in Honolulu. Another special time for this special band. It's crazy that our little Windsor High School band is going to Hawaii to, to celebrate this crazy event. It's, it's really humbling for sure. These young men and women are looking forward to more than just performing in Hawaii. They will carry with them casualty cards, pictures and short biographies of military members killed in the attack. They will play to honor them. Uh, my Marine was killed in action, obviously, and. Um, his body was never recovered. So. It'll be a nice perspective and it'll, I think it'll give me more of an appreciation for how much um, people give up for our country and how important our military and our troops are. And the band will carry with them one other memory, that of Navy Band 22, the band members who were killed on the USS Arizona that morning. A whole band was lost in Pearl Harbor and that was a, like a cool thing that we learned as a band and like that's something that a lot of people won't know. And so they practiced, sometimes into the evening under the moon over northern Colorado, for the honor of playing at a parade. In Honolulu, the day of the Pearl Harbor Memorial Parade was hot and humid. The band members didn't seem to care. This is what they had been waiting for. As they tuned up and got prepared, they learned about one important aspect of military life. Often, you hurry up and wait, and wait and wait. After waiting for hours, which probably felt like days, it was finally showtime. Thousands of people packed Kalakaua Avenue in Waikiki as the Windsor Band marched and performed. It was a proud moment for them and a happy one for the onlookers. And for the band director, Rob Dara, this living history lesson came to life. His goal for this trip to Pearl Harbor was much more than just being in a parade. Just thought it was something great for the kids to, to learn about, something great for them to experience. Um, that's part of history. Marching into the night, stepping back into history. Both important lessons for the Windsor students. Coming up, what it's like to visit Pearl Harbor today, 75 years after the attack. This place is a history lesson and a memorial, and it's a lot more. What each country was thinking 
and what were those priorities at that time. When people see the film of the attack on Pearl Harbor, many assume the Japanese destroyed the entire U.S. fleet there. But actually, three battleships were lost. The Arizona and Utah were beyond salvage. The USS Oklahoma was raised, but too damaged to restore. All the rest of the ships were ultimately repaired and returned to service. Up from the ashes were the West Virginia, California, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee, among others. They come here by the thousands to the Pearl Harbor Visitor Center just outside of Honolulu. Some come to remember, others to learn. Many come to honor those who were lost. And then there are those who aren't quite sure why they come. What I find really interesting is that we do still have people who will come to Pearl Harbor, they'll go to our ticket counter, and they will say, I know I'm supposed to come to Pearl Harbor, but what, what is there to do here? So it shows that our story is still a story that we have yet to reach a lot of people with, and it's really critical that we, we do reach those people. It's the story of what happened the day the Japanese attack. The story told in many ways, including a visitor's center museum that features a picture of a very young Donald Stratton. A survivor from Colorado Springs is featured. And then there are the stories from many living survivors and vets who go there frequently. Sometimes they share a picture, give an autograph, a living history for a younger generation. National Park Service historian Daniel Martinez says at its core, this is a story about misjudging an enemy. I think that the Americans for the most part didn't think it would really happen that the Japanese would never do such an atrocious thing um, and a daring thing and gamble their country, but we were absolutely in many areas misunderstanding the Japanese intent. But most people come to the visitor's center to learn about the stories in the water. There are markers to show where the ships were lined up the day they were attacked. Ships like the West Virginia, the Tennessee, the Vestal, and the Arizona. 21 at all sitting in Battleship Row. It is the memorial built over the sunken USS Arizona that draws the most visitors and the most emotion. As they approach it from a boat, they begin to notice not only the building, but the oily water under it. After 75 years, the Arizona is still leaking oil from its grave. The ship was fully loaded, ready to head out, more than one million gallons of fuel oil on board. When it exploded, about half exploded with it. The other 500,000 gallons are still in the wreckage, very slowly seeping out. Some experts think that minuscule leak will continue for centuries. Others are worried there could be a catastrophic release as the ship continues to deteriorate. Inside the memorial, thousands of names of victims, including 68 civilians. The, the memorial represents all of those that were killed on December 7th, it's right on the plaque. However, it is the tomb for nearly 900 plus men, but it's representative of the attack on Oahu, not necessarily the attack on Pearl Harbor because all of the airfields were struck before bombs even started to fall here at Pearl Harbor. The Arizona Memorial is a moving tribute, a history lesson, and an oily grave that has a profound impact on almost everyone who goes there. It tells stories, sad but important, stories we need to hear, to remember. Our visit to Pearl Harbor for the 75th anniversary is something I will always remember. It taught me a few things. More on that coming up.
My trip to Hawaii for the 75th anniversary events taught me some things. Seeing the monuments, learning the history, telling the story, taught me how important it is to remember and embrace the past. The consequence of war is on display in those hallowed waters. It should remind us all just how devastating war is. And should teach us to recall history, to try and avoid repeating it. Attending the 75th anniversary events taught me something about life. Even though they gathered to remember a nightmare, that gathering was, in the end, uplifting. Yes, the attack was brutal. Honoring it was wonderful. We offer you our most heartfelt thanks for all you sacrifice and all you suffer. It's a life lesson about the power of resiliency. Getting to spend time with high school students from Colorado taught me about the future. The Windsor High School band members came to Hawaii to perform, but the trip was so much more significant. They reflected on young people a generation ago about their age when they lost their lives. Some who, like them, played in a band, and others who surely had many of the same hopes and dreams they do. It was a high school history lesson like no other. They learned it and absorbed it. And that bodes well for their futures and for the countries. Finally, the survivors at the Pearl Harbor events taught me about courage. Their faces are weathered now but their spirit is as strong as ever. They suffered more than we will ever know. Yet they did what they were trained to do when they had to do it. They ran toward the danger, fought the enemy, didn't think twice about it. Then they went on to live long, productive lives. Their stories need to be heard. These survivors showed us again why we owe them so much. They remind us why, on that day 75 years ago, everybody was a hero. You can't help but get a little emotional walking through the Punchbowl Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. Many of the heroes that we have been talking about are resting here. This is a sacred place, and if you listen to their stories, they teach us lessons, lessons we should never forget. Thanks for watching our coverage of the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor.
There's probably no day in our history that is more poignant than December 7th, 1941, you know, the attack here on Pearl Harbor. And uh, it's where, you know, the war started for the United States. This was the thing that launched us into the war. Uh, but the most meaningful uh, thing for us here is to have our veterans here who have not only survived Pearl Harbor, but other uh, World War II veterans who survived the war. Uh, the example that that greatest generation uh, paved for us uh, still resonates with us today in the Navy. So I took an old book and said, if you will give me your parents' address and dictate a short note, I will see if they get it. So I spent the afternoon taking dictation. And the surprise to me was that uh, there's no complaining. They just said to their folks, you know, I'll be all right, don't worry, I'll get home someday. And many of them died that night. But that, I think, God took me by surprise that there wasn't a complaint. Everybody was optimistic and cheerful. <laughs>